Well, Mike, the proof is in the eating, and you're going to tell us a little bit about the results, which, of course, I'm aware of, which is why I rely heavily on the formulas of both of my compadres down there on a daily basis. So, Mike Steiner. Well, Doug, thank you very much. It's really a privilege for me to be here today, and I get to show the fun stuff. I'm going to show results. So what we're going to talk about today is the first prospective study of a completely new, data-driven, self-validating, continuously evolving IOL power selection method. So this is the Hill RBF method, and I want to emphasize that it is a method. It is not a formula. It is a method, okay? So the method looks at evaluating a data set, and that's using pattern recognition based on the artificial intelligence. Three variables yielded better results than 12 variables, so it's really more the amount of data rather than the number of variables. And the artificial intelligence with the RBF is very good at predicting the pattern recognition using feature extraction, feature matching. And when there are gaps in the data, one strength of this method is that it uses a sophisticated form of interpolation to guess where we might be based on the patterns surrounding it. It is free of calculation bias, irrelevant whether the eye is short, long, medium, it does not care. It's just seeking data patterns. And the predictive accuracy improves as more data is used to expand the model. That's more data, not more variables. So it does use artificial intelligence based in neural networks with the radial basis activation function. In case you're curious, that's where RBF came from. It took me about two months of using it before I figured that out, so I, I'm a slow learner, I guess. And it has the hidden layers in which these activation functions are. And quite frankly, as I start talking about artificial intelligence, my eyes start to glaze over and I get a little bit confused. And when Warren tries to explain this to me, he's really very kind, he's brilliant, he solves complex mathematical equations at stoplights just for fun. And he says, well, Mike, you know, the underlying math of this really makes my teeth hurt. What he meant by that is it really makes your teeth hurt and I'm trying to make you feel better. So thanks, Warren. It did make me feel a little bit better. But, you know, really I, I kind of thought about it and I said, do you really have to be an automotive engineer to appreciate that kind of a machinery on a beautiful day on a road like that? Well, maybe not. As long as it's easy to drive, it's all good. So enjoy the ride because we're going to jump right into the study. So we had three study sites. This is Dr. Hill's practice in Mesa, Arizona, Dr. Scoper's practice in Norfolk, Virginia, and my practice in Cincinnati. Our study criteria were stringent. We did have patients selected out of our own cataract practices. They had to have good visual potential. No amblyopia, please. No significant retinal or corneal pathology. And only patients with regular astigmatism were accepted. Irregular astigmatism was an exclusionary criteria. They had to meet all of the LENSTAR measurement validation criteria, of which there are several, but fortunately easy to achieve in most patients, because the method is validated and optimized for the LENSTAR LS900. Patients with prior refractive surgery were excluded. We used only patients who were receiving either the SN6AD1 or the SN6OWF since these implant lenses have a similar asphericity and a similar A constant. You learned about inbounds and out-of-bounds. We only used cases which were inbounds because we know that that's where we're within our boundary model. Out-of-bounds cases were excluded. And we chose patients with a near plano aim for this study. All patients had in-the-bag placement of an intraocular lens with the capsule rexus covering the optic margin for 360 degrees. All patients were followed for at least one month of follow-up with a very reliable refractive endpoint. And the data showed 467 cases with IOL powers ranging from a low of 7.5 to a high of 30, axial lengths from under 21 to over 29, Pre-op anterior chamber depths from 2.1 to more than double that at 4.6, and mean keratometries of less than 40 to over 48. And we were looking for a half diopter accuracy. Yes, you heard me correctly, a half diopter accuracy. Because these are the days where that's where we really need to be. 
How low can we go? Well, first of all, IOLs are only available in half diopter steps. Now, in all fairness, IOLs are measured in air, and if we look at how their effect is in, in the aqueous at the spectacle plane, that's the equivalent of about 0.3 diopters. The four opters are in quarter diopter increments. So at a certain point, we reach the mathematical limits of the exercise with the tools that we mostly have in our offices. You want to see some results? I'll show you some results. So when we look at all comers, 91% of patients in this 467 I set were within a half diopter of target. That's pretty darn good. But we felt that we should stratify these by axial length. Why, you may ask? Well, the lens star keratometry is superb. We know that. Our axial length accuracy is superb. We know that. What we don't know is the ELP. That is always our limitation in predicting which implant lens power. When we think about axial length and ELP, there's a couple things to consider. First, the anterior chamber depths are more similar among axial myopes and among normal eyes than they are among axial hyperopes. Axial hyperopes can have either very, very short chambers or very, very long chambers, and it's all bets off. Some axial hyperopes are shallow, some are not. Also, and when we have short, average, and long eyes, they're going to behave differently for these reasons. In addition, the shorter our eyes typically will have higher IOL powers, and the ELP has a bigger impact for higher IOL powers. Now, just take my word for that. For those that don't believe it, think about a Plano implant. Does the ELP really matter where it is in the system? Not really. So obviously, the higher we go, the more effect it's going to be, and the more important it becomes. We define short as less than 22 and a half, normal 22 and a half to 25, and long as 25 or greater. So let's look at the axial myopes when we segmented those out. 98.4% within a half a diopter. 98.4%. I just don't know how I could possibly even need to say anything more about that slide. That's just amazing. And no, no eyes had zero power implants. I know you guys are checking with me here and the people paying attention to two slides previously because those two implants are not available in zero power. So let's look at the normal axial lengths. 92.2% of 347 eyes are within target. Darn good. That's amazing. And it's way better than what the overwhelming majority have been getting in their practices even today. But let's look at the axial hyperopes. This is a super important group of people, and we were able to get 84.5%, far better than in most settings, within a half a diopter of target using this formula, uh, using this method, excuse me. So it's particularly important because of the wide variation in the anterior chamber measures and the wide variation of keratometry in these hyperopic eyes. So let's take a moment and let's compare to our traditional go-to formula for hyperopes. Well, there's a holiday too. It didn't fare quite as well. Quite clearly, RB off outperformed the Hoffer Q also. And, and just to keep in mind, th these formulas are from the 1990s. That's the previous millennium. And the Barrett and Olson actually performed very similarly. So the retrospective, the, excuse me, the prospective study has a few important take-home points for us. One is that the excellent performance is in all axial length groups. It's a totally new method. It's totally different. And it learns with increased data. The potential for this is absolutely unlimited. The Lenstar will actually start shipping with this uh, formula in place in August. Current Lenstar users will get a software update. Thanks very much. Thanks, Mike.